Chapter 15, Section 3, Subsection C of Capital, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Capital, A Critical Analysis of Capitalist Production, Volume 1, by Karl Marx. Translated from the third German edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Frederick Engels. Part 4. Production of Relative Surplus Value. Chapter 15. Machinery and Modern Industry. Section 3. The Proximate Effects of Machinery on the Workman. Subsection C. Intensification of Labor. The immoderate lengthening of the working day, produced by machinery in the hands of capital, leads to a reaction on the part of society, the very sources of whose life are menaced, and thence to a normal working day whose length is fixed by law. Thenceforth a phenomenon that we have already met with, namely the intensification of labor, develops into great importance. Our analysis of absolute surplus value had reference primarily to the extension or duration of the labor its intensity being assumed as given. We now proceed to consider the substitution of a more intensified labor for labor of a more extensive duration and the degree of the former. It is self-evident that in proportion as the use of machinery spreads and the experience of a special class of workmen habituated to machinery accumulates, the rapidity and intensity of labor increase as a natural consequence. Thus, in England, during half a century, lengthening of the working day went hand in hand with increasing intensity of factory labor. Nevertheless, the reader will clearly see that where we have labor not carried on by fits and starts, but repeated day after day with unvarying uniformity, a point must inevitably be reached where extension of the working day and intensity of the labor mutually exclude one another in such a way that lengthening of the working day becomes compatible only with a lower degree of intensity and a higher degree of intensity only with a shortening of the working day. So soon as the gradually surging revolt of the working class compelled Parliament to shorten compulsorily the hours of labor and to begin by imposing a normal working day on factories proper, so soon consequently as an increased production of surplus value by the prolongation of the working day was once for all put a stop to, from that moment capital threw itself with all its might into the production of relative surplus value by hastening on the further improvement of machinery. At the same time a change took place in the nature of relative surplus value. Generally speaking, the mode of producing relative surplus value consists in raising the productive power of the workman so as to enable him to produce more in a given time with the same expenditure of labor. Labor time continues to transmit as before the same value to the total product, but this unchanged amount of exchange value is spread over more use value. Hence, the value of each single commodity sinks. Otherwise, however, so soon as the compulsory shortening of the hours of labor takes place, the immense impetus it gives, the development of productive power, and to economy in the means of production, imposes on the workman increased expenditure of labor in a given time, heightened tension of labor power, and closer filling up of the pores of the working day, or condensation of labor to a degree that is attainable only within the limits of the shortened working day. This condensation of a greater mass of labor into a given period thenceforward counts for what it really is, a greater quantity of labor. In addition to a measure of its extension, i.e. duration, labor now acquires a measure of its intensity or of the degree of its condensation or density. Footnote 75. There are, of course, always differences in the intensity of labor in various industries. But these differences are, as Adam Smith has shown, compensated to a partial extent by minor circumstances peculiar to each sort of labor. Labor time as a measure of value is not, however, affected in this case, except in so far as the duration of labor and the degree of its intensity are two antithetical and mutually exclusive expressions for one and the same quantity of labor. End of footnote 75. The denser hour of the ten hours working day contains more labor, i.e. expended labor power, than the more porous hour of the twelve hours working day. The product, therefore, of one of the former hours has as much or more value than has the product of one and one-fifth of the latter hours. 
Apart from the increased yield of relative surplus value through the heightened productiveness of labor, the same mass of value is now produced for the capitalists, say, by three and a third hours of surplus labor and six and two thirds hours of necessary labor, as was previously produced by four hours of surplus labor and eight hours of necessary labor. We now come to the question, how is the labor intensified? The first effect of shortening the working day results from the self-evident law that the efficiency of labor power is in an inverse ratio to the duration of its expenditure. Hence, within certain limits what is lost by shortening the duration is gained by the increasing tension of labor power. That the workman moreover really does expend more labor power is ensured by the mode in which the capitalist pays him. Footnote 76 especially by piecework, a form we shall investigate in part six of this book. End of footnote 76. In those industries, such as potteries, where machinery plays little or no part, the introduction of the factory acts has strikingly shown that the mere shortening of the working day increases to a wonderful degree the regularity, uniformity, order, continuity, and energy of the labor. Footnote 77. See Report of the Inspector of Factories for 31st October 1865, end of footnote 77. It seemed, however, doubtful whether this effect was produced in the factory proper, where the dependence of the workmen on the continuous and uniform motion of the machinery had already created the strictest discipline. Hence, when in 1844 the reduction of the working day to less than 12 hours was being debated, the masters almost unanimously declared, quote, that their overlookers in the different rooms took good care that the hands lost no time, end of quote, and that, quote, the extent of vigilance and attention on the part of the workmen was hardly capable of being increased, end of quote, and therefore that the speed of the machinery and other conditions remaining unaltered, quote, to expect in a well-managed factory any important result from increased attention of the workmen was an absurdity, end of quote. A footnote 78, report of the Inspector of Factories for 1844 in the quarter ending 30th April 1845, pages 20 to 21. End of footnote 78. This assertion was contradicted by experiments. Mr. Robert Gardner reduced the hours of labor in his two large factories at Preston on and after the 20th of April 1844 from 12 to 11 hours a day. The result of about a year's working was that, quote, the same amount of product for the same cost was received, and the workpeople as a whole earned in 11 hours as much wages as they did before in 12. End of quote. Footnote 79. Location cited, page 19. Since the wages for piecework were unaltered, the weekly wages depended on the quantity produced. End of footnote 79. I pass over the experiments made in the spinning and carding rooms because they were accompanied by an increase of 2% in the speed of the machines. But in the weaving department, where moreover many sorts of figured fancy articles were woven, there was not the slightest alteration in the conditions of the work. The result was, quote, from 6th January to 20th April 1844, with a 12 hours day, average weekly wages of each hand ten shillings one and a half pence from 20th april to 29th june 1844 with day of eleven hours average weekly wages ten shillings three and a half pence footnote eighty location cited page twenty end of footnote eighty here we have more produced in eleven hours than previously in twelve and entirely in consequence of more steady application and economy of time by the workpeople. While they got the same wages and gained one hour of spare time, the capitalists got the same amount produced and saved the cost of coal, gas, and other such items for one hour. Similar experiments, and with like success, were carried out in the mills of Messrs. Horrocks and Jackson. Footnote 81. The moral element played an important part in the above experiments. The work people told the factory inspector, quote, We work with more spirit. We have the reward ever before us of getting away sooner at night. And one active and cheerful spirit pervades the whole mill, from the youngest piecer to the oldest hand, and we can greatly help each other. End of quote. Location cited, page 21. End of footnote 81. 
The shortening of the hours of labor creates to begin with the subjective conditions for the condensation of labor by enabling the workman to exert more strength in a given time. So soon as that shortening becomes compulsory, machinery becomes in the hands of capital the objective means systematically employed for squeezing out more labor in a given time. This is effected in two ways, by increasing the speed of the machinery and by giving the workman more machinery to tend. Improved construction of the machinery is necessary partly because without it greater pressure cannot be put on the workman and partly because the shortened hours of labor force the capitalist to exercise the strictest watch over the cost of production. The improvements in the steam engine have increased the piston speed and at the same time have made it possible by means of a greater economy of power to drive with the same or even a smaller consumption of coal more machinery with the same engine. The improvements in the transmitting mechanism have lessened friction and what so strikingly distinguishes modern from the older machinery have reduced the diameter and weight of the shafting to a constantly decreasing minimum. Finally, the improvements in the operative machines have, while reducing their size, increased their speed and efficiency as in the modern power loom, or, while increasing the size of their framework, have also increased the extent and number of their working parts as in spinning mules, or have added to the speed of these working parts by imperceptible alterations of details, such as those which ten years ago increased the speed of the spindles in self-acting mules by one-fifth. The reduction of the working day to twelve hours dates in England from 1832. In 1836 a manufacturer stated, quote, the labor now undergone in the factories is much greater than it used to be, compared with thirty or forty years ago, owing to the greater attention and activity required by the greatly increased speed which is given to the machinery. End of quote. Footnote 82. John Fielden, location cited, page 32. End of footnote 82. In the year 1844, Lord Ashley, now Lord Shaftesbury, made in the House of Commons the following statements, supported by documentary evidence. Quote, the labor performed by those engaged in the processes of manufacture is three times as great as in the beginning of such operations. Machinery has executed, no doubt, the work that would demand the sinews of millions of men, but it has also prodigiously multiplied the labor of those who are governed by its fearful movements. In 1815, the labor of following a pair of mules spinning cotton of number 40, reckoning 12 hours to the working day, involved the necessity of walking eight miles. In 1832, the distance traveled in following a pair of mules spinning cotton yarn of the same number was 20 miles, and frequently more. In 1835, query 1815 or 1825, the spinner put up daily on each of these mules 820 stretches, making a total of 1,640 stretches in the course of the day. In 1832, the spinner put up on each mule 2,200 stretches, making a total of 4,400. In 1844, 2,400 stretches, making a total of 4,800, and in some cases, the amount of labor required is even still greater. I have another document sent to me in 1842 stating that the labor is progressively increasing, increasing not only because the distance to be traveled is greater, but because the quantity of goods produced is multiplied, while the hands are fewer in proportion than before, and moreover, because an inferior species of cotton is now often spun, which it is more difficult to work. In the carding room there has also been a great increase of labor. One person there does the work formerly divided between two. In the weaving room, where a vast number of persons are employed, and principally females, the labor has increased within the last few years fully 10%, owing to the increased speed of the machinery in spinning. In 1838, the number of hanks spun per week was 18,000. In 1843, it amounted to 21,000. In 1819, the number of picks in power loom weaving per minute was 60. In 1842, it was 140, showing a vast increase of labor. End of quote. Footnote 83. Lord Ashry, location cited, pages 6 to 9, pass him. End of footnote 83. 
In the face of this remarkable intensity of labor, which had already been reached in 1844 under the Twelve Hours Act, there appeared to be a justification for the assertion made at that time by the English manufacturers that any further progress in that direction was impossible, and therefore that every further reduction of the hours of labor meant a lessened production. The apparent correctness of their reasons will be best shown by the following contemporary statement by Leonard Horner, the factory inspector, their ever watchful censor. Quote, now as the quantity produced must in the main be regulated by the speed of the machinery, it must be the interest of the mill owner to drive it at the utmost rate of speed consistent with these following conditions, namely, the preservation of the machinery from too rapid deterioration, the preservation of the quality of the article manufactured, and the capability of the workman to follow the motion without a greater exertion than he can sustain for a constancy. One of the most important problems, therefore, which the owner of a factory has to solve, is to find out the maximum speed at which he can run, with a due regard to the above conditions. It frequently happens that he finds he has gone too fast, that breakages and bad work more than counterbalance the increased speed, and that he is obliged to slacken his pace. I therefore concluded that as an active and intelligent mill owner would find out the safe maximum, it would not be possible to produce as much in eleven hours as in twelve. I further assumed that the operative paid by piecework would exert himself to the utmost consistent with the power of continuing at the same rate. End of quote. Footnote 84. Report of the Inspector of Factories for quarter ending 30th September 1844 and from 1st October 1844 to 30th April 1845, page 20, end of footnote 84. Horner, therefore, came to the conclusion that a reduction of the working hours below 12 would necessarily diminish production. Footnote 85, location cited, page 22, end of footnote 85. He himself, ten years later, cites his opinion of 1845 in proof of how much he underestimated in that year the elasticity of machinery and of man's labor power, both of which are simultaneously stretched to an extreme by the compulsory shortening of the working day. We now come to the period that follows the introduction of the Ten Hours Act in 1847 into the English cotton, woolen, silk, and flax mills. Quote, the speed of the spindles has increased upon throstles five hundred and upon mules one thousand revolutions a minute, i.e., the speed of the throstle spindle, which in 1839 was four thousand five hundred times a minute, is now in 1862 five thousand, and of the mule spindle that was five thousand is now six thousand times a minute, amounting in the former case to one tenth and in the second case to one fifth additional increase. End of quote. Footnote 86, Report of the Inspector of Factories for 31st October, 1862, page 62, end of footnote 86. James Nasmith, the eminent civil engineer of Patrick Croft near Manchester, explained in a letter to Leonard Horner, written in 1852, the nature of the improvements in the steam engine that had been made between the years 1848 and 1852. After remarking that the horsepower of steam engines being always estimated in the official returns according to the power of similar engines in 1828 is only nominal, footnote 87, this was altered in the parliamentary return of 1862. In it the actual horsepower of the modern steam engines and water wheels appears in place of the nominal. The doubling spindles, too, are no longer included in the spinning spindles, as was the case in the returns of 1839, 1850, and 1856. Further, in the case of woolen mills, the number of gigs is added, a distinction made between jute and hemp mills on the one hand and flax mills on the other, and finally stocking weaving is for the first time inserted in the report. End of footnote 87 And can serve only as an index of their real power, he goes on to say... Quote, I am confident that from the same weight of steam engine machinery we are now obtaining at least 50% more duty or work performed on the average, and that in many cases the identical steam engines which in the days of the restricted speed of 220 feet per minute yielded 50 horsepower are now yielding upward of 100. 
The modern steam engine of 100 horsepower is capable of being driven at a much greater force than formerly, arising from improvements in its construction, the capacity and construction of the boilers, etc. Although the same number of hands are employed in proportion to the horsepower as at former periods, there are fewer hands employed in proportion to the machinery. End of quote. Footnote 88. Report of the Inspector of Factories for 31st October 1856, pages 13 through 14, 20, and 1852, page 23. End of footnote 88. Quote, in the year 1850, the factories of the United Kingdom employed 134,217 nominal horsepower to give motion to 25,638,716 spindles and 301,445 looms. The number of spindles and looms in 1856 was respectively 33,503,580 of the former and 369,205 of the latter, which, reckoning the force of the nominal horsepower required to be the same as in 1850, would require a force equal to 175,000 horses, but the actual power given in the return for 1856 is 161,435, less by above 10,000 horses than, calculating upon the basis of the return of 1850, the factories ought to have required in 1856. End of quote. Footnote 89. Location cited, pages 14 through 15. End of footnote 89. Quote, the facts thus brought out by the return of 1856 appear to be that the factory system is increasing rapidly. That although the same number of hands are employed in proportion to the horsepower as at former periods, there are fewer hands employed in proportion to the machinery. That the steam engine is enabled to drive an increased weight of machinery by economy of force and other methods, and that an increased quantity of work can be turned off by improvements in machinery, and in methods of manufacture, by increase of speed of the machinery, and by a variety of other causes. End of quote. Footnote 90. Location cited, page 20. End of footnote 90. Quote. The great improvements made in machines of every kind have raised their productive power very much. Without any doubt, the shortening of the hours of labor gave the impulse to these improvements. The latter, combined with the more intense strain on the workmen, have had the effect that at least as much is produced in the shortened, by two hours or one-sixth working day, as was previously produced during the longer one. End of quote. Footnote 91. Reports, etc., for 31st October 1858, pages 0 through 10. Compare reports, etc., for 30th April 1860, page 30. End of footnote 91. One fact is sufficient to show how greatly the wealth of the manufacturers increased along with the more intense exploitation of labor power. From 1838 to 1850, the average proportional increase in English cotton and other factories was 32 percent, while from 1850 to 1856 it amounted to 86 percent. But however great the progress of English industry had been during the eight years from 1848 to 1856 under the influence of a working day of ten hours, it was far surpassed during the next period of six years from 1856 to 1862. In silk factories, for instance, there were in 1856 spindles in the number of 1,093,799. In 1862, 1,388,544. In 1856, looms in the amount of 9,260. In 1862, 10,709. But the number of operatives was, in 1856, 56,131, in 1862, 52,429. The increase in the spindles was therefore 26.9%, and in the looms, 15.6%, while the number of the operatives decreased 7%. In the year 1850 there were employed in worsted mills 875,830 spindles. In 1856, 1,324,549, an increase of 51.2%. In 
and in 1862, 1,289,172, a decrease of 2.7%. But if we deduct the doubling spindles that figure in the numbers for 1856, but not in those for 1862, it will be found that after 1856 the number of spindles remained nearly stationary. On the other hand, after 1850 the speed of the spindles and looms was in many cases doubled. The number of power looms in worsted mills was in 1850 32,617, in 1856 38,956, in 1862 43,048. The number of the operatives was in 1850 79,737, in 1856 87,794, in 1862 86,063, Including these, however, the children under 14 years of age were, in 1850, 9,956, in 1856, 11,228, in 1862, 13,178. In spite, therefore, of the greatly increased number of looms in 1862 compared with 1856, the total number of the workpeople employed decreased, and that of the children exploited increased. Footnote 92. Reports of the Inspector of Factories for 31st October 1862, pages 100 and 130. End of footnote 92. On the 27th of April 1863, Mr. Ferrand said in the House of Commons, quote, I have been informed by delegates from 16 districts of Lancashire and Cheshire, in whose behalf I speak, that the work in the factories is, in consequence of the improvements in machinery, constantly on the increase. Instead of, as formerly, one person with two helps tinting two looms, one person now tents three looms without helps, and it is no uncommon thing for one person to tent four. Twelve hours' work, as is evident from the facts of use, is now compressed into less than ten hours. It is therefore self-evident to what an enormous extent the toil of the factory operative has increased during the last ten years. End of quote. Footnote 93. On two modern power looms, a weaver now makes in a week of sixty hours twenty-six pieces of a certain quality, length, and breadth, while on the old power looms he could make no more than four such pieces. The cost of weaving a piece of such cloth had already soon after 1850 fallen from two shillings nine pence to five and one-eighth pence. Quote, Thirty years ago, 1841, one spinner with three placers was not required to attend to more than one pair of mules with 300 to 324 spindles. At the present time, 1871, he has to mind, with the help of five piecers, 2,200 spindles, and produces not less than seven times as much yarn as in 1841. End of quote. Alex Redgrave, Factory Inspector in the Journal of Arts, 5th of January, 1872. End of footnote 93. Although, therefore, the factory inspectors unceasingly and with justice commend the results of the Acts of 1844 and 1850, yet they admit that the shortening of the hours of labor has already called forth such an intensification of the labor as is injurious to the health of the workman and to his capacity for work. Quote, in most of the cotton worsted and silk mills, an exhausting state of excitement necessary to enable the workers satisfactorily to mind the machinery, the motion of which has been greatly accelerated within the last few years, seems to me not unlikely to be one of the causes of that excess of mortality from lung disease which Dr. Greenhow has pointed out in his recent report on this subject. Footnote 94. Report of the Inspector of Factories for 31st October 1861, pages 25 and 26. End of footnote 94. There cannot be the slightest doubt that the tendency that urges capital, so soon as a prolongation of the hours of labor is once for all forbidden, to compensate itself by a systematic heightening of the intensity of labor, and to convert every improvement in machinery into a more perfect means of exhausting the workmen, must soon lead to a state of things in which a reduction of the hours of labor will again be inevitable. Footnote 95. The agitation for a working day of eight hours has now, in 1867, begun in Lancashire among the factory operatives. End of footnote 95. 
On the other hand, the rapid advance of English industry between 1848 and the present time, under the influence of a day of ten hours, surpasses the advance made between 1833 and 1847, when the day was twelve hours long, by far more than the latter surpasses the advance made during the half-century after the first introduction of the factory system, when the working day was without limits. Footnote 96 the following few figures indicate the increase in the so-called factories of the United Kingdom since 1848. In cotton. Cotton yarn in 1848 exported were 135,831,162 pounds of weight. In 1851 the quantity exported was 143 million nine hundred and sixty six one hundred and one hundred and six pounds of weight in 1860 the quantity exported was 197 million three hundred and forty three thousand six hundred and fifty five pounds of weight and in 1865 the quantity exported was 103 million seven hundred and fifty one thousand four hundred and fifty five pounds of weight of sewing thread in 1848 the quantity exported is not available in 1851, the quantity exported was 4,392,176 pounds of weight. In 1860, the quantity exported was 6,297,554 pounds of weight. And in 1865, the quantity exported was 4,648,611 pounds of weight. In cotton cloth, the quantity exported in 1848 was one billion ninety one million three hundred and seventy three thousand nine hundred and thirty yards in eighteen fifty one it was one billion five hundred and forty three million one hundred and sixty one thousand seven hundred and eighty nine yards in eighteen sixty the quantity of cotton cloth exported was two billion seven hundred and seventy six thousand two hundred and eighteen thousand four hundred and twenty seven yards and in 1865, the quantity exported was 2,015,237,851 yards. And in 1848, the quantity exported was 11,722,182 uh, pounds of weight of yarn. And in 1851, the quantity exported was 18,841,326 pounds of yarn. In 1860, the quantity exported was 31,210,612 pounds of yarn. And in 1865, the quantity exported was 36,777,334 pounds of yarn. Of flax and hemp cloth, in 1848, 88,901,519 yards were exported. In 1851, the export of cloth was 129,106,753 yards. In 1860, it was 143,996,773 yards. And in 1865, it was 247,012,529 yards of flax and hemp cloth. In silk yarn, in 1848, the quantity exported was 466,825 pounds of yarn. In 1851, the quantity exported was 462,513. In 1860, the quantity exported was 897,402 pounds of yarn, and in 1865 the quantity exported of silk yarn was 812,589 pounds of yarn. Of silk cloth, the number for 1848 is not available. In 1851, the export consisted of 1,181,455 yards of silk cloth. In 1860, it was 1,307,293 yards of silk cloth, and in 1865, it was 2,869,837 yards of silk cloth. 
of wool, woolen and worsted yarns, for 1848 there are no numbers, for 1851 the export was 14,670,880 pounds of woolen and worsted yarns. In 1860 the quantity exported was 27,533,968 pounds of woolen and worsted yarns. And in 1865, the quantity exported was 31,669,267 pounds of yarn. Uh, wool cloth, for 1848, there are no numbers. In 1851, the quantity of woolen cloth exported was 151,231,153 yards. In 1860, the quantity exported was 190,371,507 yards. And in 1865, the quantity exported was 278,837,418 yards of woolen cloth. In cotton, turning to the value of the exports, in 1848, the value of exported cotton yarn was 5,927,831 pounds sterling. In 1851, it was 6,634,026 pounds sterling. In 1860, the value of exported cotton yarn was 9,870,875 pounds sterling. And in 1865, the value of exported cotton yarn was uh, 10,351,049 pounds sterling. The value of exported cotton cloth in 1848 was 16,753,369 pounds sterling. In 1851, the value of exported cotton cloth was 23,454,810 pounds sterling. In 1860, the value of exported cotton cloth was 42,141,505 pounds sterling, and in 1865, it was 46,903,796 pounds sterling, the value of exported cotton cloth. For flax and hemp, in 1848, the value of the exported yarn was 493,449 pounds sterling. In 1851, it was 951,426 pounds sterling. And in 1860, it was 1,801,272 pounds sterling. And in 1865, it was 2,505,497 pounds sterling, being the value of exported flax and hemp yarn. For flax and hemp cloth, the number in 1848 was 2,802,789 pounds sterling, being the value of exported cloth. In 1851, the value of exported flax and hemp cloth rose to 4,107,396 pounds sterling. In 1860, it was 4,804,803 pounds sterling. And in 1865, the value of exported flax and hemp cloth was 9,155,358 pounds sterling. For silk, the value of silk yarn exported in 1848 was 77,789 pounds sterling. In uh, 1851, it was 196,380 pounds sterling. In 1860, it was 826,107 pounds sterling. And in 1865, the value of exported silk yarn was 768,064 pounds sterling. For silk cloth, there are no numbers for 1848. In 1851, the value of the exported silk cloth was 1,130,398 pounds sterling. In 1860, the value was 1,587,303 pounds sterling. And in 1865, the value of exported silk cloth was 1,409,221 pounds sterling. Turning to wool, 
The value of exported wool yarn in 1848 was 776,975 pounds sterling. In 1851 it was 1,484,544 pounds sterling. In uh, 1860 the value of exported wool yarn was 3,843,450 pounds sterling and in 1865 the value of exported wool yarn was 5,424,047 pounds sterling. Exports of wool cloth in 1848 were valued at 5,733,828 pounds sterling in 1851, exports of wool cloth were valued at 8,377,183 pounds sterling. By 1860, the value of uh, exported wool cloth stood at 12,156,998 pounds sterling. And in 1865, the value of exported wool cloth stood at 20,102,259 pounds sterling. See the Blue Book, Statistical Abstract of the United Kingdom, Numbers 8 and 13, London 1861 and 1866. In Lancashire, the number of mills increased only 4% between 1839 and 1850, 19% between 1850 and 1856, and 33% between 1856 and 1862. While the persons employed in them during each of the above periods of 11 years increased absolutely but diminished relatively. See Report of the Inspector of Factories for 31st October 1862, page 63. The cotton trade preponderates in Lancashire. We may form an idea of the stupendous nature of the cotton trade in that district when we consider that of the gross number of textile factories in the United Kingdom it absorbs 45.2% and of the spindles 83.3% of the power looms 81.4% of the mechanical horsepower 72.6% and of the total number of persons employed 58.2% location cited pages 62 to 63 and the footnote 96 end of chapter 15 section 3 of capital volume 1